In Jerusalem, A.D. 30, Jesus died on the cross, resurrected on the third day, and then ascended into heaven. Fifty days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, giving them power, purpose, and a plan. And out of joy, the church was born. Empowered by the Spirit, Peter gave his first sermon, and 3,000 hearts were transformed. Hearing, receiving, and repenting, the young church walked in unity and garnered praise. Peter and John then continued to spread the gospel through preaching and miracles, and the church grew by 5,000. In AD 31, Stephen gave a powerful sermon, and the enraged crowd stoned him, making him the first Christian martyr. Around AD 34, on the road to Damascus, the Lord transformed the heart of Saul, a man who persecuted countless Christians, and Saul became Paul. In AD 44, King Herod Agrippa I executed the Apostle James and had Peter arrested. But an angel rescued Peter, leading him out of the prison. As the believers were scattered because of persecution, the center of operations for Christianity turned from Jerusalem to Antioch, where Paul and Barnabas were sent out on their first missionary journey. On his final missionary journey, Paul traveled through Galatia, Phrygia, and Ephesus, encouraging the disciples in the cities. He then spent three months in Greece before traveling to Jerusalem, where he was arrested. Paul was then sent to Rome for trial, but the ship wrecked on the island of Malta. When he finally arrived in Rome, he lived there for two years before Nero ordered his beheading. And after 28 chapters, the story of Acts came to an end, yet the story of the gospel didn't stop there. Out of joy, the church multiplied. In AD 80, Christianity spread further to the countries of France and Tunisia. Twenty years later, the first Christians were reported in Algeria and Sri Lanka. By AD 150, the gospel reached Portugal and Morocco. Christianity found its way to Austria in AD 174, followed by Switzerland and Belgium. In AD 328, the gospel reached Ethiopia. Almost 200 years later, Pope Gregory I sent Augustine of Canterbury and a team of missionaries to present-day England. And within the first year, they baptized 10,000 people. In AD 635, the first Christian missionaries arrived in China. In AD 740, Irish monks brought the gospel to Iceland. But it wasn't until AD 900 that missionaries reached the country of Norway. Out of joy, the church multiplied. By 1200, the Bible was available in 22 languages. In 1491, missionaries arrived in the African Congo with the first church located in Angola. A few years later, Kenya reported its first known Christians. Meanwhile, in Spain, Pope Alexander VI wanted to send Catholic missions to the New World. As a result, Christopher Columbus took priests with him on his second journey to the Americas. In 1531, Franciscan Juan de Padilla started his mission work in Mexico City. By 1550, John Calvin sent French Protestants to reach the people of Brazil. In 1640, Jesuit missionaries finally reached the Caribbean, landing on the island of Martinique. Out of joy, the church multiplied. The early 1700s saw the rise of the Great Awakening in America where both George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards stirred revival throughout the colonies. Looking back on our history, all the way back from Acts to present day, we see the church multiplying. As bearers of the good news, God calls each of us into the story and mission. Sometimes it is hard. Sometimes we must leave friends and family behind. Sometimes we must give up our comfort. But whether we go, whether we stay, Whether we pray or offer support, we are all wrapped up in this joyful call to take what started in Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. We are part of the next chapter in the story. What role will you play? Out of joy, the church multiplies. I really like that video because it just um, really shows us a little bit about that we're not alone. Sometimes I think we, we think that nothing's happening and nothing's moving. And the reality of it is, is that God has built his church 
and is building his church. Praise God. And, and here's the good part is that we get to be a part of, of that. We get to be a part of God building his church uh, here and in other places uh, around, even around the world. And that's just, that's just so cool. Um, so that video is actually from Matt Chandler's church, the Village Church, and, and uh, um, it kind of skips just a little bit. You don't notice it because Troy did such a good job editing it, but because uh, uh, it talks about their history specifically, you know. But um, and I wish we could one day Troy will get there and we'll do our history and all that. Yeah, it would be really good, really really nice that way. But um, <clears throat> but I think it's important. Like I said, I love I love it, and actually. That was that video, he made that video for the book of Acts, and so I preached through the book of Acts a few years ago, actually a year ago, uh, on Thursday nights, very significant study, uh, very significant study for me, I think, because as, uh, as you walk through the book of Acts, and you know, I, mean, I don't know how many times I've read the book of Acts, <clears throat> but when you preach something, it's just different, I mean, you begin to focus, you begin to hone, you begin to talk, you know, try to think through themes, and what is it really talking about? And, and how do I lead a church through that? And, and um, just really cool as you see the gospel going out. As you see the gospel going out over and over and over and over again. And here at Grace Gospel, we are invested in that mission. We are invested in what God wants to do in and through us. You know, our mission statement, which is on our walls, exalting Christ and pointing others to Him, we're invested in that, but, but not only are we invested in that, we're becoming even more invested in that. You know, we're, we're, I, I love our church. I think we, we, have this, we have this global mindset. We have this mindset outside of us, and yet the beauty of that is that we're not there yet, of course, and so we're invested in it, and yet we're becoming even more invested in it, and that's what we want to do. And so um, we finished up the book of 2 Corinthians and, and uh, which is really all about, and I know, I know the, the theme was, you know, God's strength through our weakness, but it's not um, God's strength through our weakness to get out of bed in the morning because we're really tired. Sometimes I think we as Christians kind of boiled God down to just a God who gives me the strength that I need so that I can live my mundane life and I can get through and I'm really tired in the morning and, 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 and God just gets me out of bed every day so I can go to work, so I can earn some money, so that I can you know, go to the grocery store, so that I can eat. <laughs> that kind of thing. And, and the reality of it is God strengthens us, especially in our weakness, not just so that, and I mean, you know, thank God he does get us out of the bed in the morning, right? But... But it's really not about that. It's really about us so that we can go be ambassadors for him. So that we can shine out Christ. And the reality of it is, and, and, and we, we've kept our clay pots up here, and I don't know how long I'm going to keep them up here because I think it's so appropriate. Uh, nobody better put a flower in here. That's not the, I don't want any flowers. It's not the point. Although we do grow, hopefully, right? We look more beautiful. Um, but we're weak. That's what I love about these is that we're like clay pots. And sometimes we're like, clay pots to the point where we break and we get shattered and we go, God, how could you ever use me? How could you ever shine through me? And he says, oh, wait, uh, when you're weak, but you're willing, oh, then I can shine through you. And then we can do some pretty great things actually in and through you. And people will come to know me because of you. And you go, but how can I do that? I'm a clay pot. How do I reflect? And he says, oh, that's what's beautiful because it's me in you shining out. And it's not about you, and it's not about how beautiful you are, and how good you are, and how talented you are, or anything like that. It's about Christ in you, shining out. And so that's what's really cool about that. So, so we've left 2 Corinthians. Um, in a few weeks, we're going to pick up uh, Habakkuk. I've never preached through Habakkuk. I'm looking forward to it. I'll, I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's a great book as it talks about, um, again, God in our weakness, and, and when we when we see everything going wrong around us, God, where are you? And it's a great book for that. So you can go read Habakkuk. It's three chapters long. Uh, it's an easy read, uh, but look at it in that view of this prophet. So in between that, though, I thought, what a great time to sit and to talk about mission in our church. And so we're going to take these next three weeks, and we're going to talk about our call and God's call upon us. 
And, and uh, you know, to look at this mission statement that we have, to look at what God called us to be, because I think as a church, we constantly need to be reminded of who we are and what we've been called to do. That's why I love reading that verse in the beginning of, 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 of our service uh, from 2 Peter. And if, you don't, if you've never heard me read that verse, that's because you don't come at 10 o'clock, right? But um, if, you, if, if, you, if you just... It's a great verse, and I'll read it again for you, just to make sure. And I've read it a lot of other times. Second, Second Peter chapter 2, just listen. I don't have it up on a board or anything, because... Uh, I'm sorry, First Peter. I don't even know where it is. First Peter chapter 2, he says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession... And, and sometimes we stop there and we want to go, oh yeah, we're God's people and, and we're the apple of God's eye and God loves us and he does and we need to own that. We need to feel that. But, but I love it because Peter says there's a purpose to that. So he says, you are my chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that, that's a purpose statement, so that, you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. You know, I mean, if, 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 if God, you know, if we just got saved and that's just all there was and we got to live in that, I mean, God could just take us to heaven right away, but he doesn't. And he doesn't because we're, we're his ambassadors. And we talked about that in 2 Corinthians. He's called us to reflect Christ in everything that we do to reflect Jesus out in all that we are and all that we do. That's what we're called to do. And uh, we, we've got to remember that. We've got, we've just got to remember that. And so uh, in Acts, we came up with a vision statement that says this, that we desire to be a Holy Spirit-empowered movement of God on mission to multiply His kingdom. That that's really what we desire to be, that as a church, if this is our mission, if we're called to make disciples, if we're called to be his ambassadors in this world, then we desire to be a Holy Spirit empowered movement of God, not a, not a um, you know, and that's what's beautiful. If you look through the book of Acts, you can go back and read through it again, and I'll preach through it on Sunday morning in a few years probably, but um, you know, it, it's a movement. That the church was not stagnant. The church is never to be stagnant. The church is not to be just some sort of refuge for us to come to, to kind of get rid of the world and get out of them and, and hide so that we can just, you know, kind of come in our holy huddle and just be by ourselves. But it's what we're called to be a movement and a Holy Spirit empowered movement of God that's on mission to multiply his kingdom. That's what we're called to be. That's, that's, and that's what we desire to be here at Grace. And like I said, I, I think we embrace that, but we're, but we're learning how to embrace that more and more and more and more and more. And so that's what we want to do. And so, um, <clears throat> again, these next few weeks, we're just going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, um, two sermons ago, I don't know, I don't remember if that was before Easter. I think it was before Easter now, so several weeks ago. We talked in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that Paul tells us to keep the main thing the main thing, right? And so we're reminded that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Right? So we're always reminded of that. And, and in that context, the point was that we need to keep Jesus in the gospel, that, that Jesus is the center of the gospel, right? Our health, our happiness is not the center of the gospel. I, I know... In America, we kind of think that way. We kind of think that everything should revolve around us. We live in our fast food world and in our instant service world, and we think that everybody should cater to us and serve us, <laughs> right? And, and sometimes we think the church should be that way, and I think it's an appropriate illustration. If you've been in the church any period of time, you might have heard an illustration like this, but, but I love it. So... Um, we were, we were at the reception last night. We had a wedding in here. Tony Joy and, and, and Chris Rickert now got married. And so um, just a wonderful, wonderful time. And Danielle and I, we were at graduation for Josh, but we got to celebrate with them at the reception. And we were talking with the Rices and the Costas about, you know, cruises. You know, anybody ever been on a cruise? All right. If you've never been on a cruise, um, they're just cool. I mean, it, opulence to the max. And actually, really, it's, it's almost, it's so wasteful, 
Right? I was telling him that, that we learned pretty early on, I'd asked the waitress, the first cruise that we take, we've been on three, the first cruise that Danielle and I took at our 15th wedding anniversary 13 years ago, is I, I asked the waitress, what, should, what, do you, what do you recommend, this meal or this meal? And she was like, well, get both. And I'm like, no, I can't get both. I'm not going to get both. No, get both. I said, no, I really, I'm not going to get both. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I can't eat both of those. I'm going to bring you both. But what that did in us is it opened some sort of floodgate. So the McCarty's go on a cruise and we're like, hey, can I try this and this and that and that? Because it all comes with the price, right? I mean, you know, we get like three desserts. We don't eat that. Well, we, all right, we don't really eat that much. Um, we try. You know, you should go to cruise skinny because you're going to come out not skinny. But... Um, it's wasteful. And so we just think, right, so we get whatever we want. That's what a cruise is about, right? And there's, there's, there's thousands of people on that cruise that are there to serve you. And we're like, yeah, I love that, right? And we think that's what the church is about too often. We think, we think Christianity is about God serving me, God taking care of me, God giving me. But I like it. I, I don't know who came up with this illustration, but it's so appropriate. The church is not a cruise ship. The, the kingdom of God is not a cruise ship. Matter of fact, the kingdom of God is more like a battleship. Right? Who of you have been in a Navy? Right? A few of you, right? Jimmy and, and, and Bob and, and, and a few of us, a few of you in here. Um, so, uh, Bob, is, is that how the Navy was? When you were on your ship... Could you just get anything you want? And they had other people there to serve you. Is that how it was? No, no, no. You didn't have comfortable beds. You, had, you, you, you stacked in a rack, right? I mean, like, you ever see that in the Navy? They have, like, that much room in between the cots. And if you're on a submarine, it's, like, that much. I don't even know. You know, right? Because they're not about their comfort. They're not about the people on the ship's comfort. They're about a mission. And so, you know, they make sure they have stores for, I mean, they're going to feed the guys because if they don't feed the guys, then they have no one to operate the battleship. But, but you know, they don't have comfy rooms with beauty. It's all gray, right? And they keep mopping it. I don't know why because you can't see any dirt on that gray, right? But they mop all the decks and they do all that stuff and they, and they shine it all up. But the reality is it's not so that it glimmers with beauty. It's so that it's able to perform the task at which it was called. And that is when it needs to defend something or attack something, it can. The church is not to be a cruise ship. The kingdom of God, the people of God, we're not on a cruise ship. We're part of the army of the Lord. And that doesn't mean that we're going to beat people up but we are on mission. God has called us to be on mission to multiply his kingdom. That's what he's called us to be. That's why we're his church. And yes, we get the benefits of the kingdom of God. We get the future of the kingdom of God, right? So we get all of those. There will be rewards in heaven, thank God. There will be all kinds of great things. It will be beautiful. It will be great. But the reality of it is, is that too often we think that, that God needs to serve us. And that's not how it is. Matter of fact, uh, he's not our God in a sense of our little God that we can move around and manipulate and make happen what we want to happen. We are his bond servants. And so he doesn't do our bidding, we do his. At least we're supposed to as the church of Jesus Christ. That's what we're, that's what we're called to do. And so, um, and so, so we want to look at that, like I said, over the next three weeks. So uh, the next two weeks, not this week, we're going to look at the, this statement, each part of that, what it means to exalt Christ and what it means to, to point others to him. Today, though, we want to get really basic, and we're going to talk about that main thing. We're going to bring out that spotlight where it talks about Jesus, and we're going to bring that out to what Christ has called the church to do. And it's the church, same for every church. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to Matthew chapter 28. <coughs> Matthew chapter 28. So this is before that story that we saw, right, of the video of Acts moving through and what happens at, the, at that time when, when Jesus commissions his disciples right before he's taken up into heaven, right, where we, where, where we, 
we, we've talked in, in Acts, we talk a lot, that, that main verse, as a matter of fact, if you want to look at the book of Acts, it really flows through just Acts 1.8. Where God says, you will receive power by the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. You will be mine. Well, before that, before that we have Matthew 28. So before the book of Acts, before the movement of God, before the the church moves out and the church is born, really, and then moves out. We have, we have Jesus talking to us and to his disciples uh, in this great commission of what we call this. And so look at what it says, chapter 18, I mean, uh, chapter 28, verse 18. Uh, I'm just going to read these three verses real quick, and then we're going to walk through that and look at what he's talking about here. <coughs> because God's all about multiplying the kingdom of God. And so we're going we're gonna to look how God does math today. All right, verse 18 says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. So I just want to walk through this because I think it's important to understand what he's talking about because when we start talking about the church... And what it really means to point others to him. And, 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 and why we even do this. Why do we exalt Christ and point others to him? It's because of this even more basic call to make disciples. That's what he's called us to do. And so look at how he starts out. So let's just walk through it. And let's understand this. First and foremost, that our call, our call and our com- the command is by the authority of Jesus. This commission is by the authority of Jesus. So look at what he says because he wants to make sure we understand. He actually puts weight behind it. He says this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now we read that really quickly because we want to get to the, to, to the great commission in verse 19, but we can't miss that. We can't miss what he is saying because too often it's not, we, we think of this as the great um, suggestion too often. Instead of the great commission. But Jesus says, listen, we've got to understand this language that's used here. He says, all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. Now, uh, you know, I've heard several sermons and you read them and and they say, man, we could just stop right there. We could preach sermons. I could preach weeks on this. on On the authority of Jesus Christ. On the authority of God. On the fact that we don't get to make decisions. He's the creator. He's the one who makes the decisions. He's the commander in chief. Right? Patrick is not the commander in chief. Jesus is the commander in chief. Such as, you know, whoever you want to say is not ultimately in charge God is in charge. And and Jesus says, listen, I am God. All authority has been given to me. You listen to what I say. All authority. Right? So so he's not, listen, Jesus is not like on a power trip. You know, it's not, it's not like Jesus is trying to trying to um you know, you know establish control in some way. He doesn't need to. He already is in control. He already is the boss. The point of why he's saying this is he's saying this to say, listen, if all authority has been given to me, you better listen to what I'm about to say. You know, those of us who are older, right, you remember those E.F. Hutton commercials? Don't raise your hand, all right, if you don't know. Because some of you are going, I have no idea what E.F. Hutton would ever be. Right? It was an insurance company, and so these people would be sitting around, and, and they would be talking about investments and all that kind of stuff. And they would be going, oh, yeah, this is what you should do. This is what you should do. And then somebody in the restaurant would say, well, E.F. Hutton says, and everybody would be quiet. And they'd listen. <laughs> because, like, if E.F. Hutton said it, it must be great. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know what? It should be. You know, we're chattering around, and we're talking about this, and we're talking about that. And then, and then God says, and everybody should, whoa, what? I need to hear what God is saying to me. And, and that's what you, this is what he's talking about. All authority has been given to me. This is exactly why it's called the Great Commission. 
It's a commission. Listen to the definition of commitment. Actually, I have it on the board. It says an authorization or command to act in a prescribed manner or to perform prescribed acts. It's a command. So um, by definition, command means it's not optional. Right? So I'm in the military, and some of us have been in the military, and some of us are still in the military. When you're commanding officer gives you a command. I mean, there are times for, for discussions. There are times for discussions. And there are times for opinions. And then when your commanding officer says, okay, this is what you're going to do, you don't go, well, but sir, but ma'am, that's not what I want to do. You, you say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. And, and you do it. You shut up and you salute, we say. You know, that's what you do. As a matter of fact, I was in COT, so commissioned officer training, and I had been enlisted before. And so COT is um, officer training for, um, for those of us who have professional degrees who are already commissioned. And so in other words, our commissioning is not based on us passing OTS, officer, uh, or OCS, officer candidate school. Um, it's already there, right? We just have to learn to do it the Air Force way. And so that was um, chaplains, lawyers, doctors, you know, those kind of people, you know. And so uh, I went in the summertime in OCS, and, and, and that meant there was a lot of um, uh, doctors in school still. So the Air Force has a great program. If you want to become a doctor, do not pay for school. Go into the Air Force. I mean, if you can get into this program, they pay for everything. And so there's a bunch of 25, 26, 27-year-olds, and at the time I was like 42. You know, I was, I was some old crotchety whatever. And, uh, and I'm the chaplain in our group for all these basically medical students. I think we had one lawyer, but they were all medical students. That's who, I had, that's who we had in our flight. And, uh, and I forget what happened, but like our, our, our commanding officer at the time, our flight leader, uh, this guy who was training us, you know, told us to do something. And I don't remember what happened, but like we were sitting around, it was a rest time or a break time. And they began talking about, we should, we should talk about this a little bit. About like whether, you know, maybe he doesn't understand this and that and the other thing. And so I just listened to it for a little while. And then I finally chimed up and I said, listen, I don't know what you're used to, but you are in the military now. When you're told to do something, you do it. I mean, unless it's immoral, right? I used to tell my kids, um, whoever came in to, to watch them, to babysit teachers, whatever, you have to do whatever they tell you to do unless it would be something that Jesus, you know, would not be happy with, right? And so they didn't have to obey. They did not have to obey the babysitter if the babysitter told them to lie for them. But anything else outside of immorality, they had to do it, you know? So, you know, the, the old, you know, when you're a kid, you get a babysitter and you're like, you're not the boss of me. So what we would do is we would throw our weight behind the babysitter, right? To say, this babysitter, so God says the same, listen, God's in charge, God commands. This is a commission to us. This is not a suggestion to us of what he wants us to do. It represents really the foundation of what the church is built for. And I, and I like, I, I forget who said it. I forget the quote. When I preached the book of Acts, uh, they said this. They said, uh, you know, um, God didn't make a, a church for his people. He made a people for his church. In other words, he gave us a command and then built the organization to do the command. Right? Organization is important. I mean, listen, you know I hate religion. I've said that plenty of times. Right? But the reality is, we need organization. God made the church, not us. And the reality is, if we're going to do it right in him, we have to have that organization in that. So, so what's the command? So what's the command? We get to this, and, and too often, we think the command is to go and make disciples. Right? But we, we attach that go to it. But you need to understand this. There's only one command in this passage. And that is to make disciples. There is one command. And that is to make disciples. What is the church called to do? The church is called to make disciples. 
The Greek is very clear there. There's one imperative, one command in that. Three ways to do that. And we'll talk about, about why, why he, how he tells us to make disciples. But it's very clear there's only one, one command in there uh, to make disciples. That's what Jesus calls his people to be, is disciple makers, to raise people up who are followers of Christ. Right? And, and you need to hear that. This, that, that Christ didn't call us to make decisions. He didn't call us even just to make converts. He called us to make disciples. Right? And that's important because too often we go, oh yeah, oh, I got another one. You know, we, we scratch in our belt. I've been on mission trips where people are like, oh yeah, yeah, I got so many people to pray with me. And they didn't even go through anything. They didn't really talk about anything. They're not really making disciples. They're just chattering a lot. And sometimes people are like, you know, finally he says, do you want to pray with me? And they're like, if that's going to end it, please let me pray with you. <laughs> you know, let me pray with you, please. Just to get you out of here. And then, then he goes away. Well, Christ hasn't called us just to have a bunch of decisions made. Christ hasn't called us just to go out there and, and, and try to tell people something so that they'll agree with us so that we'll feel good. Because too often, it becomes about us. Why do you share the gospel? It makes me feel good. Well, what happens when it doesn't make you feel good? Well, by extension, if, it, if I preach because it makes, or if I, if I tell somebody about Jesus because it makes me feel good, when then it doesn't feel good to tell them about Jesus, I'm not going to tell them about Jesus. But the command isn't about whether you're comfortable or not. About whether you feel good about it or not. The command is simply the command. As a matter of fact, I go a little step further, as God did, all right, not Patrick, but I love what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He says this, as he, as he charges Timothy, he says, the things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust, to those to, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. And I love that because there's four generations in that. As I have taught you, you teach others who can teach others. Right? You make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. It is very true of the statement that the church is one generation away from extinction. Right? God has no grandchildren. Just because your church came, your, your church, your, your children came to church doesn't make them Christians. Just because you came to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's, it's, it's by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's by, by the fact that I myself trust in him as my Lord and Savior. Right? So just because my parents go to church and they bring me to church, and even if they had some religious things done to me, like they get me baptized or I took communion or I did some of these other things, doesn't make somebody saved. And so the church ultimately is one generation away from extinction at all times. Because if we're not reproducing... And here's the deal. We don't reproduce so that the church can still be here, right? The church, is not, the church is not the end goal. The church is an instrument of God to reach the end goal, which is to build his kingdom. That's why Christ came, to build his kingdom, not our kingdom, which is why he said, I will build my church, right? But he's going to build it through us. That's what he's going to do. And so we're called to be Disciple-making disciples. Uh, I got to tell you, um, we've been convicted in this church over these last two years that we're not discipling enough. And so I've grabbed about five people that I'm beginning to have a personal relationship with to disciple. Why? Well, not so that they can just be built up and be okay because we want you know, people who are... Um, you know, just solid Christians. We want that, let me tell you. But we want those who then can reproduce. And, and we're challenging our elders to do that. And we're challenging our ladies to do that. And more and more, we want people to be getting to personal relationships to, to be able to mentor. You know, that's our new word today is mentor. But really, it's disciple. To be able to sit with them and to help them to walk through life with them and to grow with them in Jesus Christ. And I got to tell you, that's a slow process. It's not a quick process. Matter of fact, it's not a one-class process. Because sometimes churches want to go, okay, uh, we want people to be discipled, and so if you come to this class, then you'll be discipled. And we do a 12-week study on what discipleship really looks like, and we think we've done discipleship. 
And that's not what it is. It is walking through life as individuals. And, and listen, I mean, I look out, I see people, and some of you guys do this. I love it. I love it. And I've been challenged by you about how you take that. And I've had that in my life. And, and then what happens is, I mean, I, I've, I've had times where I've discipled more, you know, where I've been challenged by God and I've grabbed men because I, I disciple men. And that's really how we keep it. Men disciple men, women disciple women because it becomes an intimate relationship. It becomes a close relationship where you share things. And so I've, all, I've never been able to disciple women on a, on a deep level, you know, because it's, it's going to take a woman to do that. And so we're challenging our women to do that. And we'll, we'll be introducing some things even about that, about what we're doing to organize around that, to, to make that go further in our church. But, but, but because we need to do that, we're called to make disciples. And, and, and we're called to be disciples and we're called to make disciples. And the reality is, if you've been part of the church, I mean, and grown and mature in Christ, uh, you don't need... I mean, you don't need a, a position to be able to say to somebody, hey, let's do lunch. And hey, would you want to meet? Maybe we'll just go through some stuff in the Bible and maybe we'll just walk through life together a little bit and, and I'll just share some things with you. And the beauty of this is they often sharpen us too, right? I mean, we grow in that kind of situation. And I know we're busy and I know we got lots of things going on, but, but what's important, if Christ has called us to make disciples, let's make disciples. It's worth the sacrifice. It's worth the sacrifice. All right, so how do we go about doing that? Christ gives us a little layout here um, of how we go about doing that. All right? So back to Matthew chapter 28. <coughs> that go there. So there's, there's one command, one imperative, three participles there. So really, it should be as you go or as while going... Make disciples. So that's where we get confused. Because that's a concise word, go, sounds like a command, right? If I said to you, go, that, that, wouldn't, that would sound like a, an imperative, right? But that's not what it is in the Greek. What it is is really it should be as you go or while going, um, make disciples. That's what you should do. So, so the reality is we need to go. We need to go. Well, where do I need to go, Patrick? Wherever you go. That's the reality of it. As you go, or while going. Now, sometimes that's a call to specifically go, right? I mean, we in this room, some of us in this room have gone to places on short-term mission trips, right? Uh, um, a few of us, or a few people, and, and, and actually some of the missions that we support are people that have been in our church in the past. John Clendenin, you know, has been in Japan for a long time, and a lot of you don't know him. But there, and he'll be back this summer for a little stint, and you'll get to know him again a little bit, I hope. But, but we're his sending church. He started out, and this was, one of his, this was his home church a long time before me. Praise God. We need people who do that. But it's not just about those. It's not about the John Clendenins in the world who say, you know what, God's called me out to go. He's called. I'm convinced he's calling some of us out, whether it's short-term or long-term. I, I know short-term but maybe even long-term, right? But we think, okay, well, that's for them. That's not for me. No, 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 no. No, this is for all of us as we go. So that means tomorrow morning, you're going to do something. What are you going to do for a lot of us? Go to work. We even say it that way. You're going to go tomorrow morning. And so guess what? Take Jesus with you. And then, and then you're going to go to a meeting maybe at night or you're going to go to your softball game or you're going to go to this thing that you enjoy or you're going to go to, guess what? Take Jesus with you because you are an ambassador of Christ and as you go, you are to make disciples. As you go, and, and the reality of it is, believe, it is true, um, their discipleship happens before someone's saved also. Right? I'm, I'm, I believe that. So in other words, we're showing them Jesus as we go. And so, and so when they come into the kingdom, sometimes, very rarely, very rarely, somebody has an encounter with God like Paul. Right? But even Paul knew scripture. 
It was just about it all coming together and Jesus bringing it all together. But sometimes you have this, one, this person that has no idea about Jesus, nothing to do about Jesus, and they encounter God either through a, through a service or through a person or through whatever, and then, and then boom, God changes their heart. They're there. They're, they're part of the family of God. They believed in Jesus Christ, and they're there. That happens very rarely. Very rarely. Most of the time, it's a process. Most of the time, it's a process of... of well, I'm not so sure, and let me know about this, and, and it's talking and figuring it out and, 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 and putting away things that we have in our own head. And, and really, I, I like to say it's kind of getting over ourselves a lot of times, right? It's kind of getting us out of the equation. What, don't I have to do something? Don't I have to? It just doesn't feel right. And a lot of times it's getting all this junk that's been taught to us our whole life. I mean, our kids today, man, whew, what they're learning in schools it's just crazy. There's a lot of junk to kind of just chuck, right? And so, and, and so we're called to do that. We're called to go, to go. That's what we're called to do. And I tell you what, I could sit up here and yell all day long about that. All right, so we got to go. All right, so he says, as you go, while you go, you go. But the call is, is that we're going to go, and we are going to go. Wherever we go, we bring Jesus. Wherever we go, we're to be his witnesses, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's at play, whether, wherever we go, we're to bring Jesus, and we're to be the representatives of Jesus, and we're to share Jesus, and we're to show Jesus, and we're to help people to understand Jesus, and I get that that doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to stand on a street corner and preach, but it does mean that you are in constant prayer about the opportunities that God gives you, and you say, God... Help me to be ready now. Right? Are you ready? And I love what he says at the end. Are you ready for game day? Guess what? It's game day. It's game day. Well, I don't know what to say. Well, have, have you experienced Jesus in your life? Well, then just share that. All right. Well, what if they ask me a question? I don't know. All right. Well, keep it down. Tell them. I'll share it later. We'll get to that in a second. That's in teaching. All right. So it says going. Secondly, it says baptizing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the second part of simple there. So by going, we, as we go, and as we baptize them. Baptizing, that's how we're supposed to lead them in. Well, what does that mean? You know, it, it sounds a little weird here. I know it does, right? Especially in our culture where we want to understand. And, and, where, we, you know, we just celebrated baptism two weeks ago. And what a great day it was, right? To, uh, if, 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 if you want to go online, you can go to our website. You can, I think it's on our website. Is it on our website, Troy? The little, 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 I love that little stint that we showed you last week about what, you know, what we did with the four people who got baptized. And, um, but, but we get confused about that because we live in a culture, and I very clearly said two weeks ago, baptism does not save you. It does not save you. By being baptized, you don't get saved. Otherwise, I'd, we'd be inviting people to the pool. Right? Come, come get baptized. Well, well, why? It doesn't matter. Just get saved. You know, because once you get wet, you get saved. And, and we think that in our, in our United States of America. We've gotten to this place in the Church of Jesus Christ, and I put it around in quotes, where they think if you just get wet, you get saved. You know, we baptize our infants. Why do we baptize our infants? Because in case anything happens to them, they can go to heaven. That's not why, you know, listen, it means nothing. It just means getting wet. And I don't mean to be obnoxious about that. And I'm sorry. And if you're confused about that, please come talk to me. Let, we'll, we'll talk about why baptism doesn't save you. And yet baptism is a command, right? So we talked about that, that we're to be baptized after salvation, that it was an outward sign of an inward reality. That's something that's already gone on. So what does he mean by baptizing here? Are we just supposed to go around, you know, with a portable tub, you know, hook it to the back of your, of your van, Jimmy, just a portable tub and just get people wet. It's not what it's about, right? Well, we need to understand what baptism and what it means. So the word means in or into. It literally means um, an introduction into, right? So the reality of it is, is that when we share Jesus with somebody and, and they get to this place where they say yes to Jesus, Right? They are introduced into Christ. Introduced into Christ. And so part of their response is their baptism into Jesus. That's what happens. There's a lot of things that happen at that moment of salvation. Part of that, and we talk about this, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
It's the baptism into Christ. It's when, when the Holy Spirit, we get the Holy Spirit. He, he comes to take up residence within us. We get introduced into Jesus Christ. You know, if you will, baptized into him. And so we're to lead to that. You know, the reality is we're to go, and we often go to people who don't know Jesus, and we're to share Jesus with them, that, that pre-discipleship, that evangelism that we call it, right? We're, we're pre-discipling. We bring them to this point, or, and, and they, they come to this place where they say yes. They say yes to Jesus. It's not about praying a prayer, although you know, you're, you're often it happens through praying a prayer, but it's not about just praying a prayer. Right? Sometimes we get to that point where we just say we've got to get them to pray the prayer, the, the salvation prayer, like somehow. You don't have to pray a salvation prayer. You have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Not about that. You have to repent of your sins, to, to, be, to ask for forgiveness, and to receive the forgiveness of God in him. Right? We've talked a lot about that in this church. And, and if you don't know Jesus, please come and talk to us more about that, about what it, what it means to receive Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, right? But, but we're to lead to that point. I, I, I was challenged. I went to Romania, and, and part of what I was talking about, these guys that walk around, because we had a guy there who would walk around, and, and he'd just want people to pray the prayer. And in Romania, if you, if you talk with somebody, and then you say, would you like to pray with me? They're going to say, yes. At least 15 years ago, they would. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, I led like 400 people to Jesus this week. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Because he didn't, right? I mean, I, listen, I'm, I'm not judging the conversion of the heart because that happens within, but like I just don't think it happens that way for most, all right? Um, and that week, I, I did see several people come to Jesus with me. I mean, and I'm, I'm pretty, like, I, I keep going back. I revolve back. Wait, do you really understand? Do you really know what you're doing? Do you really get it? You know, so we'll talk about Jesus a lot. And I know because I got to go back the next year and I could see their faith and it was really, really cool. So genuine type salvation. But then I kind of became convicted. I'm like, Jesus, how come I go to this place for a week and I see people come to Jesus and like I'll be in my church for months and sometimes it feels like years, right? And nobody comes to Jesus or, or you don't use me directly to sh you know, for someone to come to Jesus. And you know what I was convicted of? I was convicted of this. Um, you went overseas. Now, listen, um, I was mainly meeting with friends of people already in the church. So they had been pre-discipled, if you can say it that way, right? They had already been shown Jesus in a lot of ways. I, 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 one of the churches, Luminita was there, and I would say to people, let me ask you a question. Is her life different? And they'd be like, yeah. Because well, they, they, they could argue with me about stuff, but then you talk about Luminita's life being different, and they were like, I, I can't argue with that. Because it was. I mean, she was like genuine, right? So... But I came to this point where I realized, you know, I actually shared the gospel there. And I would get to the place where I would ask people, are you, are you there? Do you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior now? Do you want to trust and believe in him now? Not that you need me to do that, but, we, but you can profess him now. And, and then I saw a few people do that. And I was convinced. You know what? So often in America, we never get to the point. We never get to the point where we actually talk about the gospel, about the, <coughs> about the fact that we're dead in our trespasses and sins, that on our own we're going to hell, we're, we're no good, we, we need a savior, that Jesus Christ is our savior, and that we have to have faith in that, what that looks like and what that means. And then we never get to an invitation. Because, see, we want to bring them to church because we want the pastor to do the invitation every Sunday. And I don't do an invitation every Sunday, do I? And I'm not going to start. I will, and I will talk about Jesus, and I need to talk about, hey, if you don't know Christ, come up. And we'll have people up front after the service, and we'll want people to talk about that. But you know what? It doesn't have to happen in the building. It can, and it might be that moment, and that's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, right? I mean, it has happened in here. It happened in Easter this year. Praise the Lord. Right? But it doesn't have to. I love it when people come in. I mean, I, I, I'm going to brag on David a little bit. David, you know, got baptized last week, or, or two weeks ago, and, and, and I, I just loved it because uh, you don't know this, David, but Tammy had already been talking to me, and we've been praying for you, right? And, and uh, um, I hope you don't mind me doing this, but it doesn't matter because I'm already doing it. 
right? And, and I just love it. And even that day, Tammy says, listen, I just, we're just, we're just going to tell him Jesus and we're going to do that. And so they go home and they sit, I don't know how, I forget how it worked out. And they share Jesus and David says yes to Jesus. Amen, right? And you know what? I was just as excited about David as I was with Nicole from three weeks ago, four weeks ago, when Nicole accepted Jesus in our Easter service. Praise God. So, I mean, how cool is that, right? We get to share Jesus. And the reality of it is, and I believe this, David didn't come to Christ because he came to church. Nicole didn't come to Christ because he came to church, because she came to church. Andrew didn't come to Christ because they came to church. Christian didn't come to church, Christ because they, he came to church. They came to Christ because people were investing in Jesus in them. And maybe they saw some stuff here, and that was part of it too, praise God. All right, and maybe, you know, that's where I do get an opportunity to share with a lot of people, and I love it. Uh, You know, it's so cool. But guess what? We're all called to do that. We're all called to get to the point. All right? Too often, we'll never get to the point. Too often, we think that we preach the gospel to somebody because we we said, well, praise God, uh, I just give all credit to God. That it, I, listen, that's good. Exalt Christ in everything you do. Keep doing that. But at some point, you need to get to a conversation. And then at some point, if God is leading that way, I mean, listen, don't go where God's not leading you. Please, that's not what I'm telling you to do. But if God is leading you, then you walk that way. And I got to tell you, every single time I ask somebody, do you think you want now? Maybe we could pray now and, 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 and you would just trust in Jesus. Every single time I go, God, I don't know, should I be doing this? I feel really weird about it. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe they're not. Maybe, you know, every single time. And I've had people say to me, no, I'm, I'm really not there. Actually, I appreciate the honesty if they're really, no, I, I just need to go home and I need to think about it. And I've had people who have said yes. Matter of fact, I've had people who, who in some ways have basically said, I've been waiting for someone to ask. Baptizing them. And then finally teaching them. Right? You know, uh, uh, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Holy, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Listen, the commission is not just to go and not just to bring them into the faith. It is then teaching them in the faith. And that doesn't mean just bringing them to church. It is great that they come and be involved in a church. They need to be involved in a local fellowship. They need to be under authority. They need to be all that stuff that a church brings. They need to do that. But they also need just a personal walk where people walk with them. Somebody walks with them. It's not just about getting them to Bible study. It's not just about, I mean, I've, I've been frustrated for years in the church as we go, all right, what do we do to disciple? All right, we're going to do a Bible study. And so we do a Bible study. And you know who comes to the Bible study? Everybody that comes to every other Bible study. Right? And the people that need to come to the Bible study, maybe you get one or two, but you're inviting them like crazy and they don't come. Because we got to go. See, we keep wanting them to come to us. And, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Sometimes we need to do that. And I think discipleship happens in our small groups and happens on, on our Bible studies and things that we do on Tuesday morning, Thursday night, and, and homes and things like that. I mean, I think discipleship happens, but that's not it. Right? See, we're called to walk. If we're called to go... And we're called to, to introduce them. In other words, to introduce them to Jesus and to get them to that point so they get baptized into, the, into Christ and then eventually get baptized. Because that's, you know, we're, we're called to be baptized as a sign of what's happened on the inside. But then we're called to teach. Oh, no, no, I'm not qualified for that, Pastor. And, and listen, I get it. I mean, you've got to be a disciple to, to make a disciple. And if you're not a disciple... And I, I say this a lot. I've said this a lot. You know, we have a lot of teachers in our church. Um, just because somebody sits in a classroom doesn't make them a student. It just doesn't. Matter of fact, we have a lot of kids sitting in classrooms in college and high school and whatever, who aren't students. They're just there because they have to be. A student is somebody that engages and that's, and that's there and that's present, right? And that's really learning. And that's what we're called. We're called to be a disciple and then we're called to make disciples. And there's no doubt that some of you are in a place where you're in that disciple make, you know, building stage where you're being built up in your faith. But guess what? It's not just so that you can be good. God blesses always to be a blessing. 
And so that's why that, that focus on discipleship has been really just, just uh, we've been convicted again to that because really that's what it's about. We're called to make disciples. It's, it's our mission. It's part of who we are. Yes, we're called to exalt Christ and to point others to him. Why? Because we're called to make disciples, right? The reality of it is we can just exalt Jesus because we've been saved. I can praise God all day long because of what he's done in me. But as I played that one Sunday in, in 2 Corinthians, that song, Shine, you know, let them, let them wonder what you got. Let them wish that they were not on the outside looking, looking in. You know, you live Jesus in such a way that Christ is emanating from you. Well, where do I do that? Everywhere. As you go. And then, okay, so all I have to do is live and I never have to talk. Oh, no. You have to talk. <laughs> because, listen, at some point, they just think that you're just good. And then it becomes about you, and you don't want them to be that. When they say, what in the world? Peter says, right after that verse that I love to read, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. Always be ready. Always be ready to share Jesus. Always be ready to do that. That's what we're called to do. Listen, keep the main thing the main thing. Christ has called us to make disciples. He hasn't called just me to make disciples. He hasn't just called our, 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 our Sunday school teachers to make disciples. He hasn't just called you know, our, our elders to make disciples or our Bible study leaders to make. He's called us to make disciples. All right? Not a disciple of you. That's important. Not a disciple of me, a disciple of Jesus, right? And I get you say, well, I'm not equipped for that. Okay, then you come to me. Listen, I'm full on discipleship right now. I really am. And that's not because I don't like you. I, I, you know, if I, have, I, I, I wish I could spend time with everybody, but I shouldn't be spending time with everybody. You come, and, and I'll, you might get a phone call, and I might say, hey, listen, uh, uh, this guy or gal came to me, actually. I would love that if, if some of you would come to me and say, hey, I would love to be in a discipleship relationship. I would love that. You come to me, and then I'm going to call some of you. So be praying now. Don't, because, listen, because the, the ask is always, hey, would you be willing to pray about that? Guess what? You already know. And it might not, you might say, eh, I don't know if I'd connect with that person, whatever. I'll try. And sometimes you don't connect with somebody, and that's okay. You know what I mean? But be doing that. Be doing that. That's where we are. Christ has called us to do that. He's, he's called us to be part of that movement, like that video we watched. You know, I love that. The movement of God across the, the continents and around the world. And he's called us to be a part of that. And I love what they say in that video. What's your place in it? What's your place in it? Listen, some of you are called downstairs. To, 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 to teach our children. We need Sunday school teachers. We do. Now listen, I don't want you to teach Sunday school because we need Sunday school teachers. I want you to teach Sunday school teachers because you're called. And I'm completely convinced that we have people called who aren't doing it. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not beating anybody up. <laughs> maybe you're called to, to grab somebody. As a matter of fact, maybe this message is wearing on you because God's been telling you for a while, hey, why don't you talk to that person and just get together with them? <laughs> and we feel really weird. And, and it is, I got to tell you, it's a really weird ask to say, hey, would you like to meet with me on some sort of regular basis so that we can talk about just growing in Jesus Christ, of your growth specifically in Jesus Christ? Wait a minute, I gotta, that's weird. Yeah, it is. And it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. I got to tell you, as a young pastor, I, I, I went to my district superintendent and said, I need a mentor. Actually, I said, I need someone to disciple me. And I went to other people. I, I couldn't find anybody. We couldn't find anybody in our district. I went outside of our district. Now, we were near Connecticut. So, but I had to drive two hours to meet with a pastor who would meet with me just to kind of help me because I was young just needed help, you know, how not to be a jerk as a pastor. I didn't learn really well. <laughs> Some of you know that. I'm not joking. I mean, sometimes I, listen, I, I get caught up and we all get caught, you know, I'm still learning, 
No, that's what I said, right? We, we embrace it, and yet we're still embracing it. All right, so that's where we are. God's called us to make disciples. So go. Go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that God has can. Guess what? You don't go alone. He says, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. I don't have the strength to do that, Patrick. I'm just a pot. I don't have the strength to do that, Patrick. I'm a broken pot. I know. That's good. As a matter of fact, you're just about in the right place because your strength doesn't come through how good you are and how solid you are and how beautiful you are. Your strength, ultimately, if it's a God strength, it comes from Him. And God, all He needs is willing. And some people give up. Listen, if you try something and it doesn't work, that's okay. It just wasn't for you. Try something else. Talk to somebody else. Love them enough to see Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you so much. I thank you for your call upon us to make disciples, Lord. I, I thank you for your call upon us, Lord, as a church to, um, you know, to exalt you and to point others to you, Lord. And I thank you for the desire. I believe that you're placing in us, that you're placing in us to, to be a Holy Spirit empowered movement of God on mission to multiply your kingdom. God, your math is great because you are into multiplication. Out of joy, the church multiplies. May we be part of the equation. Lord, I love you, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.